much for coming along to this evening's event as part of the Festival of Learning. Obviously we're quite an intimate group this evening, but I think that should actually be really good to be some interesting kind of discussion and questions and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of, sort of the format of the evening, um, what we've kind of decided is that Bryce is going to, going to give us a fantastic talk um, and then we'll just really kind of open the floor for some really informal discussion and take it from there. Um, Bryce, for those of you that don't know him, is a senior lecturer in our School of Design, Engineering and Computing. And very excitingly, Bryce has just been awarded the Isambard Kingdom of Brunel um, Award Series Lecture as part of the British Science Festival. Now, for those of you that are a bit less geeky than I, and um, might not necessarily know about these things, they said that's the lecture series that launched Brian Cox's career. So we may be small in number this evening, um, but hopefully Bryce will remember us when uh, you're off having a fantastic media career. So without... I will remember you. <laughs> I know what to do. Yeah. Uh, without further ado, it um, gives me an enormous pleasure to introduce Bryce. Thanks. Uh, this will be very informal, so uh, I'm going to stay seated and not stand around until I start jumping a little bit later on. Um, this talk is based on one that I gave last year on sports technology and disability and prosthesis in sport. Um, and I've done a little bit more work on it since then, added some things in that I'm going to test ahead of what I'm doing later this year. So if it ends disastrously, at least I know it was worth trying. Anyway, where we originally started in sport, thousands of years ago, back to the Greek Olympics, where we first started, it was a very, very basic competition. Sport was conducted really to show the physical prowess of its citizens of different regions within Greece. It was only competed by men, they did it naked, no women were allowed within the Colosseum, and the sports were very, very basic. It was essentially running, jumping, throwing sort of events, and technology didn't really play much of a part in that. Although, strangely, drug taking actually did, but I'll come on to that a little later on. Uh, actually, I'll say that now, actually. Um, what actually happened was, when everyone talks about performance enhancing drugs in sport, and people getting banned for it, when they actually go to the original Greek Olympics, one of the athletes was thrown out for eating olives from a different region, which was considered a, a, a big deal in those days. It was considered performance enhancing to eat food from outside your region. So he was thrown out and eaten by lions, I think. <laughs> anyway, we then move into the 1950s, where disability sport begins to take hold. And, and disability sport came about mainly as a, uh, there was a, a doctor, Dr. Goodman, who was tasked by the British government to try and attempt to rehabilitate people that had been injured in combat, predominantly initially through spinal injuries. Uh, so when, what they actually discovered was, was, or what they actually intended was, was that sport became a very really good form of rehabilitation because it gave someone a sense of purpose and ability to measure themselves. Oh. Uh, so the first sports that actually competed over, which was done at Stoke Mandeville, which is up near Hemel Hempstead, was actually wheelchair archery, and that's a shot of it there. This photo is around 1952, uh, and you can sort of get an idea that the technology is very, very basic, wheelchair, very basic bows. Move on again, moving up to the modern day, things have changed quite radically for those that would have seen London obviously a few months ago. Uh, sports now big business. Money is massive. Someone like um, Oscar Pistorius, who's currently obviously under murder investigation, um, but he is a, was, I should say, a multi-million pound athlete, main endorsements from Nike, that sort of thing. Uh, had a lot of money coming in, so it's big business. Winning races, it's medals, it's money, it's exposure. So disability has become, for lack of a better expression, quite cool in a way. So. Pick out four different pictures, and I've changed this from the last one. Right, so we have a fast skin swimsuit. We have what we call spaghetti stringing in tennis rackets. We have a golf ball. And we have the uh, over a tuck riding position, uh, cycling in other words. Anyone know what all of these things have in common? Other than facts or technology, any idea at all? Go on. And it's not the same as last time. So oh, is it not? It is not. I was like, changed two of the pictures. So, what do these all have in common, rather than the odd one out, which is what I did last time? No, I don't know that one. No. What do they all have in common? Take a wild guess. Uh, they dramatically increase the performance of the athlete. Uh, yes. Um, the artificial? Uh, ish. Mm. The actual truth is, go on, go on, take a guess. Um, they Sort of. The actual answer is that all of these innovations are banned, all of them. 
uh, the swimsuit, I which was the last time. Uh, no, because the difference was last year. <laughs> I had a picture of Pistorius in there, and he wasn't banned, he was reinstated. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all of these innovations are actually banned, under different reasons and different conditions. The swimsuit in the top left, the fast skins you may have seen, what they did was actually reduce the hydrodynamic drag of a swimmer in the water. And it got so bad in the end. I mean, they were introduced in 2000, Ian Thorpe, the Australian torpedo, sort of pioneered its use. But what happened was, in the end, was that so many world records fell in 2008 that um, it was becoming a bit of a farce where swimmers that people had never heard of in heats were still breaking world records. So they banned it, which was unfortunate because it meant that the world record, records that had already been established couldn't then be taken away. So now swimmers are having to overcome records that have been established under different conditions. Spaghetti stringing, which is a new picture, that was an innovation in the 1970s. That's whereby several layers of strings were actually layered together. And it was introduced in, I think it was 1976, what actually happened was, for those of slightly uh, probably older than I am, there was a player, uh, Nastasi in the 70s, who was a very big tennis player at the time, very uh, glamorous, shouty, McEnroe-esque kind of player. Anyway, this, this innovation was introduced, and suddenly players that no one had ever heard of were sending out massive service speeds, incredibly powerful serves. And they were so powerful, in fact, that good players, such as Nastasi and other people, Jimmy Connors, couldn't return the ball. So in the end, uh, the game actually naturally changed. It's what we call reskilling. It's whereby the nature of the sport is altered by the introduction of the technology. And they banned it in the end because tennis back then was becoming less of a serve and volley game and more of a power service game. Actually, ironically, it's how it's ended up now anyway. But back then, they decided to get rid of it. The Polara golf ball looks the same as a normal golf ball, but it's actually subtly different. It has dimples over it, like a traditional golf ball, but those dimples are different sizes and different shapes. What it actually does is it makes the golf ball actually go straighter and truer, and it actually reduces hooking and slicing. Now that's great if you're a player who's not very good, but if you're actually a good player, it actually made no difference whatsoever. So what happened was you've got a narrowing of the field. Good players remain the same, and bad players suddenly got quite good. So they banned it because it was just, it was taking the skill, it was de-skilling the game of golf. The last one, O'Grey, the Scotsman who is as famous for, well that actual bicycle he's riding there, he actually made from components from a washing machine, that's probably what he's most well known from. Um, he was a very innovative, highly troubled individual, he tried to hang himself three times. He was a very typical sort of creative genius, he couldn't live with himself. Actually all of his attempts failed and he's actually probably a far happier person now. But the point was back then he invented a really unique method of riding a bicycle and in terms of actual power output, in terms of his actual physiological ability, he's actually not particularly gifted at an elite level. But because of his brain, because of his innovation, his attention to detail, he broke several world records and was a world champion. In disability sport, it's not without its controversy either. Um, there's three, I've got three examples up here. Um, this is new from the last one as well. This one here is obviously Oscar Pistorius, as I mentioned, is under the sort of political charge at the moment. But actually, the point with Oscar is was that he's arguably changed the face of athletics because what he attempted to do was to cross over from disability sport to able-bodied sport. What was good about Oscar was was he not only did he cross over, he suddenly became very, very competitive and beat able-bodied athletes, and that raised a whole raft of questions about possibly how should we look at disability, and is actually disability really what we thought it was? Um, the top left here, this is a guy called Casey Martin, he's a golf player and he has a, uh, a, a muscular issue in his leg, it, 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 he struggles to walk long distances. Uh, so what he wanted to do is, he's a pro level golf player, or well, he was in America, and what he wanted to do is, what do you have the use of a golf cart to get around between all 18 holes? And the golf company body didn't like this very much and they decided to try and ban him because they felt that using a golf cart changed the nature of golf and it made the game easier. Uh, so it went to court and they lost because the case that Martin raised was that arguably the, the game of golf, the ability to get a ball in a hole over a great distance, isn't really affected by the fact that I've travelled to it via a four-wheel electric golf cart. So he used the disability laws in the US to his advantage and in the end he was able to you know, continue his professional career. He's now a coach. One on the bottom there, this is Pistorius again, but actually isn't really about him, it's about this guy here, a guy called Alan Oliveira, who's a Brazilian. And at the last Olympics, obviously go back to last September, uh, there was a bit of a furore that I briefly got caught up with, um, whereby uh, Pistorius, ironically, claimed that Oliveira had an advantage because he'd changed the actual 
sugar, he would actually change the actual length of his prosthesis to make his legs longer. Therefore, the story said had an advantage because he was actually taking less steps to cover the 200 metres he was running over. I'll show you later why that wasn't actually true. Uh, but it was quite ironic that having had the stories defend himself four years prior, that four years later, the stories would then claim someone else had an unfair advantage. So it's a bit tricky. When it comes to technology with the disabled, it's an awkward subject because there's a fine balance between facilitating sport, giving someone the ability to do something and do it well, but also the ability to performance enhance them. And this example here is a project that I worked on last year, or year before last, which was a prosthesis design for an Irish athlete, and he was at the Paralympic Games. Fortunately, came fourth. Uh, it wasn't a nice person to be around for a while. Um, but he actually he did a fantastic job. He's actually prior, he was actually a rugby player until five years ago, and he suffered an injury whilst playing rugby, uh, a really freak accident, one in a million accident, and they had to amputate his leg. And through a sort of a coming together of events that, again, I got caught up with, we took what he had, which was a very poor prosthesis that the NHS had supplied, and I tried to create something for him. I designed it, and the company actually built it. Uh, prosthesis that would hopefully give him a competitive advantage in his event. So it's kind of ironic really, I probably spent the first few years of my research career arguing about how it's all grossly unfair and in the end I ended up doing the same thing myself. <laughs> uh, there we go. Alright, so now I'm going to talk about ethics a little bit and the problem with ethics. Ethics are all arguably, it's a relative concept. The, uh, ethics is almost like the opposite of, of science and science method. And the example I'm going to give you, and I won't make you do this because there's not enough of you, but I'm going to do this with other school kids next month, which is why I put it in. If you can kind of think for a minute in the, uh, think of a scenario whereby uh, a house needs to be built for a family. You know, we would all think, we would assume that that would be okay. If, provided that it's legal, provided that it doesn't affect anyone else, and that no one is harmed in the process, that it's okay to build that house. Take that example, and let's move it on a little bit. So let's say we're now going to build flats, not a house, and we're going to try and house more people. Think in your own mind whether you think that is still actually a good idea. And at this point you might think, mm, not so sure. Let's try an example again. Let's say now you want to build those flats, but you want to knock down some trees while you do it. Is it in your own mind still okay as a situation? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Move it on one last time. Let's say we're going to build a heaving amount of flats, and now we want to build onto green, green belt land as well. Do you still think it's okay about housing that many people versus the environmental damage that you might do as a result? It's an ethical example, it's an ethical decision. And everyone will react to this, this debate in their heads in a slightly different way. And philosophers use different expressions of actually, there's, there's different thought systems used to define how someone considers different situations. So for example, we have what we call uh, egoism, which is whereby a person will make decisions based on what they think is best for themselves. Or you might have something uh, like consequentialism, which is whereby someone will do, the end justifies the means, basically in simple terms. And everyone thinks about different situations in different ways and judges decisions in different ways. Some people, for example, if you take, if you look at, uh, I don't want to hover on religion for too long, because it always gets me into trouble, but if you hover on religion for a little while and think about sometimes the one thing that every religion has in common throughout the entire planet is what we call the golden rule. Treat other people as you wish to be treated. Apart from that, there isn't actually a lot of other con consistency then diverges between religions, but the important thing is some people believe that you should go into a situation with the best of intentions, you should do the right thing. Other people believe that the end justifies the means, and they're both opposing views or opposing ways of looking at the same problem. Consider this. Take the, uh, let's think of a good example, the Hiroshima bomb that we dropped, obviously, or one that we dropped at Nagasaki, whereby thousands of people were killed or maimed. Now, arguably, that bomb, or that dropping that bomb, whilst ultimately horrible, ultimately saved lives because it ended the world war. So you have this debate in your head. If you take, obviously, two different ethical systems, you could argue, did the fact that all those people lost their lives but yet more were saved, is that a rational transaction, is that a rational decision? Or alternatively, is the fact that anyone died whatsoever wrong initially and dropping anyone was incorrect? So ethical things, ethical situations are very difficult because everyone has a radically different opinion on it. So ultimately, it's the tug of war and sport and technology is the tug of war between science, 
stranger than around there, and <laughs> philosophy. And where I come in, I'm not actually an engineer, I don't actually call myself an engineer. I'm a product designer, which means I weigh up the more humanistic and philosophical issues with the more technical engineering base. And I try and marry them together when I create products or I, I judge situations. But it is very, very difficult to satisfy everyone, and re in reality, you can't. I'll give you a short history of prosthetics now. The first prosthesis ever found that was made out of, that was found, I think it was 3,000 years BC. It's made out of wooden leather. It's a toe prosthesis that was found in an Egyptian mummy, mummy, whereby the entire front of the foot has been amputated and then they've obviously tried to construct a replacement. The interesting thing about that one actually is the fact that they've actually tried to give it an aesthetic look. They've tried to make it look like a real foot as best the technology could at the time. Come forward a couple of thousand years, we've got Queen Vishpla, who had an actual iron prosthesis on her leg. She lost her leg in combat, uh, had the, the actual prosthesis made out of iron, must have weighed a ton, <laughs> and then had it refitted to allow them to ride a horse and return to combat. As you noted by the fact as well, actually, that she's actually female, which is very unusual at that time to be female and involved in combat. That's a completely different topic. Right. This, which you won't see very often the back here, but this is actually barber surgery. Um, <coughs> amputation, initially amputation was performed by removing the limb as quickly as possible using the sharpest implement available. Uh, what that would mean is because we're going prior to things like uh, anaesthetic and that kind of thing, the point was to remove the limb and cauterise it as quickly as possible before the person died of blood loss. So, um, this image probably shows it is graphically worse. What would happen is, four people would hold you down on a table, a barber surgeon with a hacksaw, which is what he's holding there, would then remove the limb as quickly as possible. His assistant would then cauterise it using either boiling oil or a fire or a torch to seal it as quickly as possible before so much blood ran out and the person died. And as a result in those days, most people with amputations generally died from either blood loss or infection. Um, because obviously we don't have anaesthetic quite yet. So it was a pretty brutal process. It was the only way to treat things like gangrene and infection that had been caused in combat or war. Move on a bit later. We're only getting back probably two or three hundred years ago now. Proceeds have moved on a little bit. They're much more cosmetic. We've got hinge joints, there's your articulation. That fits over the top of the stump, or the, in this particular case, actually, the stump will come down to about there, actually. But it allows a degree of movement and it allows someone to, to a certain extent, regain the mobility to a point they've actually lost. This prosthesis here is where we're getting more into activity. This is um, a prosthesis that's actually got a sprung lower shank there to deal with shock absorption, a bit of articulation at the knee. And what that will do is it will actually allow someone to actually run effectively. So the limb, through weight of itself, will kick forward and swing back, and that spring will absorb the shock because a lot of things that your actual lower limbs do is absorb shock and shock impact. Things radically changed in 1984. A guy called Van Phillips, who was actually a, an amputee himself, I can't remember how he lost his limb, I think it was through climbing, but I'm not sure. Uh, he had a bit of an idea, he had a concept, and his concept was based upon a sword, and it was based upon the cheetah. And what he actually did was he created a prosthesis that effectively was made out of carbon fibre and was a spring. What it allowed them to do is it actually allowed them to regain mobility and to absorb energy and return it without a lot of weight and it allowed someone to regain mobility but more importantly to actually be able to perform locomotion, walking, jogging and running at a reasonably high speed at a reasonably low energy cost which was groundbreaking and obviously that's then moved into sort of like 1988 that technology was introduced in sport and that allowed someone to actually then perform high speed activity. Up to that point, uh, effectively, they were using very basic prosthesis and would limp their way down the track. And it was very difficult because what you have is, is that the stump that goes into prosthesis where the limb has been severed, um, you get that changes shape quite a lot because there's a lot of fluid in there. And due to, if you can imagine wearing a pair of shoes, three sizes too small, you'll get blisters, you'll get rubbing. Think of the same thing, but larger. That's what happens inside, that what happens to someone's stump inside a prosthesis. So it's incredibly uncomfortable. So the basic prosthesis and the socket that joins into, because they've been improved, allows them to run further, faster, and with greater comfort. Which is where we get to today. And this is a modern running prosthesis, typically of what Pistorius and all his competitors would have worn. What you've got is you've got, you've got the socket here, which is made out of carbon fiber. The stump of the athlete, this is what the, um, the actual amputee here has a sock, which is made out of silicon. 
that will then slot into this socket and the whole limb is suspended so there's nothing touching the lower part of the stump because it's a very painful area. Uh, that socket is then bolted onto this actual spring here which is made out of carbon fibre and then in this case um, he's actually put running spikes on there, that's all you need, you have to wear shoes obviously because you've got no feet. So these are the different, an amputee is not the same, all amputees are not judged equally basically, there's, there's four basic types of amputees that you'll see. One of the more confusing things about the Paralympic Games that Channel 4 tried to address this, and they did a pretty good job with it, was to try and explain to the general public what different disabilities are and what the differences between them are because a disability sport, everyone is given a category and those categories are very hard to understand. Um, in terms of actual amputees, you've got four basic types. You've got what we call a unilateral transtibial amputee. What that basically means is he has lost one limb. And transtibial means that the amputation has been taken through the tibial, the tibial bone area, through the lower leg. In the case of someone, if we go to the next one along, that's what we call a, uh, a bilateral transtibial athlete. So that's whereby, actually no, he's only lost, no, he has lost both statues, Oliveira. Um, he's actually had a double amputation. And in fact, there's two ways that, there's two specific ways that someone will generally lose their limb. It's either through a birth defect, which is less common. More commonly, about 90% of them are through a traumatic injury. Normally something quite, well, traumatic obviously. But um, in the case of Pistorius, who's the next guy along here, who again is a double transtibial amputee, he lost his because he was born without some of the bones in his lower feet, basically. And the parents had to make a difficult decision, an ethical one, obviously, whereby uh, he looked, he was born in appearance looking as an able body would look. So he had feet, he had legs. The only problem was because the lower bones were missing, he had nothing to stand on. So his legs were effectively just whopping. There's nothing they could do. So the parents were faced with the choice. Do we put the guy potentially in a wheelchair, but give him a higher quality of life, or do we let them look in inverted commas normal? It's not the right expression, but it's how they would have exp how they expressed it. Um, but he won't have the same level of quality of life or activity. And in the end, they wisely decided to go with the amputation. He lost his limb, but actually, because of his attitude, because of his mindset, he was playing sport at a very young age. He, he water skis, he played rugby, he has prosthesis for a wide range of different things that he can actually do. Go on the far right hand side here, that's Richard Whitehead. He's a double. Uh, transfemoral amputee. That's whereby the amputees have the amputation performed above the knee and in his case both limbs. So his prosthesis takes up the majority of his limb and he has no need to, to actually you know, use. So if you look at the way he runs, he actually runs like an egg whisk. It's, it's quite unusual, very effective. Um, but as a result he has no articulation so his knee cannot bend. Also a rather unusual bit, I've only met him once, he's built like Hercules above the way, he's absolutely <laughs> massive, yeah, built like a bodybuilder. Um, but obviously below it's just all business, you know, there's no excess muscle tissue, just all the prosthesis in the world. So, is it all unfair? What is fairness? Well there's four different philosophical concepts, you have to get, kind of get your head around when we judge technology. And, uh, I did some work with the governing body a couple of years ago and there are certain criteria that we have to evaluate in sports technology. The first thing is about when you introduce technology, is it safe? So in the case that I've used boxing headgear there, there's an R to that I'll come back to in a minute, but is the item safe? The second one is, is the item accessible to anyone if they wish to use it? So if a technology, should a technology, you know, it should have a, the ability to be equal access, equal opportunity. The other thing is, does any technology affect participation levels? So if we introduce a technology in the US, let's say a cybernetic limb for the sake of argument, if, for example, someone in Ghana or India can't access that technology because they can't afford it or they, there is no supply chain there, then arguably that technology should not be introduced, be introduced at a global level. And the last example is outright cheating over the sport. This is uh, Major Onoshenko, I think his name was. I think it was the 1972 Munich Games or similar like that. Anyway, basically what happened was he was a fencer, part of the Russian fencing team. All was going well. He was, you know, if you remember, two people face each other in fencing and you have to get the, uh, the epi, the end of the epi, the sword, effectively to touch the opposing person. And this guy was fantastic. He was touching this guy left, right and centre and sailing through the qualification heats. It all got a bit suspicious later on though, when it turned out they had a button that it installed inside the fence, inside his epi effectively, that would register an artificial hit. 
So he'd actually never hit his opponents. All he did was he just tapped it in the right direction, pushed the button, registering a hit. Um, in the end, uh, the, uh, the authorities got wise to what was going on and disqualified him and his entire team, which probably didn't make him very popular because they had won a medal at the time. Um, that's what we call gaining an advantage over the sports rather than advancing over your competitors. And these are the four basic criteria. The example I was going to come back to with the boxing headgear is, um, so I, I mentioned this last night as well, it's what we call a revenge effect. Sometimes if you introduce a technology, you get a byproduct as a result of it that was unforeseen or unexpected. In that case, boxing headgear hasn't actually reduced head injuries. It's actually increased them as a result. More people get head injuries now in amateur boxing because of that headgear being introduced. The difference is that the severity of that injury is lower. But the problem is, is what they think has happened is psychologically, because you see someone is protected, you think, I'll give him a harder hit then, because he's obviously protected. So as a result, the head injuries are more severe, because that little mechanism just lets you hold back just a little bit has been removed. So arguably, introducing a technology, even if it's a safety-based one, isn't always the right thing to do. Ultimately, though, as far as disability sport goes, it's about giving every athlete, irrespective of country, background, social standing, and finances, an equal ability to participate and succeed. The, the question here is, though, is this arguably where we're going to go? And this is really whereby the, the, the talk and a lot of the controversy surrounds the subject. Are we ending up all going to be cyborgs? Are we going to end up with wires and you know, cyborgs running around the Olympic you know, athletics pitch in 40 years time competing. And in reality, this technology is already possible because it already exists. So when you see all the news about, oh, this is going to happen in the future, it won't happen in the future, it is happening now. Because in reality, this is a, a, a cybernetic limb that's been invented. You can't really see it from where you are back there, but basically this is actually plugged into the back of his head, effectively. This is connected to his brain and allows him to regain basic movement in this case, the ability to actually have a drink from a person that actually was amputated in the upper part of his arm. So it's clunky. It's a bit like mobile phones. Cast your mind back 1990. A mobile phone was like this. Okay, you sort of irradiate your head as well. But that's a different story as well. Um, the point is, it was very large. Battery life was poor, and it was heavy. Come forward 20 years, and you've all got smartphones now that are five millimeters thick, 15 milli, you know, 150 millimeters long. Don't weigh anything, and the battery lasts 24 hours. So it'll only take time before that technology is miniaturised, the, the power pack is, you know, is modified to allow it to last longer, and then people are going to have that kind of improvement. If you take the example over here, where you've got a basketball player using, uh, it's a, it's, it's a semi-automated limb map. What that limb actually does is, is that the knee is operated by a computer, so the knee senses when he is swinging his upper leg and corrects its position in the air to make sure it clears the ground or returns into its position where it should do, so it contacts the ground to allow the next step to be taken. So that stuff is already out there. So, the big question is, are they performance anyway? And in reality, what this, this simple sort of image here, what he's trying to show is, this is an able-bodied runner. The hip, the knee, and the foot area, or the ankle actually as that actually is, all contribute to the ability to run. The knee provides what we call stiffness, actually makes the limb a stiff rather than just floppy, to allow force to be transmitted down through the leg to the ground and then the ability to push off the ground. The ankle does similar amounts. The actual ankle actually generates the majority of your power. Um, something I'll come on to later is about how, how energy efficient the ankle actually is. And the hip basically coordinates it. When you have a unilateral amputee, an amputee that's lost something below the actual knee, the hip still works in a similar way to the able-bodied person, but it has to compensate, it has to do a little bit more work. The knee still operates as it should do, and there's very little contribution from the ankle because there is no ankle. If we take someone over here, like a bilateral amputee, where we have two limbs, the hip still does everything again, the knee again contributes, but we're not really sure, or the argument in academia really falls around, does actually, when you have a two-limbed amputee, is there, does it have a big contribution or a small one? And we're still not sure. So how do we run fast? There are three basic things that will allow a person, irrespective of whether they're disabled or not, to run quickly. It's effectively how much force you put on the ground, so how much force you transmit through the ground. The more force you put down, the more reaction, you know, it gives an opposite and equal reaction back, so the higher off the ground you push. The other thing here is how quickly you can move your legs. The faster you move your legs, the greater distance you'll cover. 
And the last one is how long your stride is. So the longer your stride, the greater your distance. Actually, more recent research in the last 10 years has actually shown these three things are not considered equally. What actually happens is this is the most important one. Number one, the more force you put down, the better the sprinter. When we look at the best sprinters, the Usain Bolt of this world, or Pistorius or anyone else, they basically transmit more force to the ground. Because they put more force down, they spend more time in the air, which means their stride length is longer, and ultimately, what they've also shown is this turnover rate, this amount of times per second, doesn't change. Even at the start of the race when they're going from zero, accelerating, holding their speed, and then dying a thousand deaths at the end, the actual step rate uh, is actually the same. It never changes. So what kind of procedures actually do? Right, time for some props. <laughs> this is where all goes horribly wrong. Okay, I'll do the basic one first. There are two basic mechanical components to a prosthesis that a prosthetist, the person that designs a prosthesis, needs to consider with their patient. The first one is energy return. Your ankle is 250% efficient. In other words, it can generate two and a half times the energy put into it. In other words, it generates power. A person with amputation can't do that because they have no ankle. So the only thing they've got is the prosthesis. And effectively, I'm going to use a ball as an example, okay? All that they can do is imagine dropping a ball from a given height and you drop it, you get a percentage distance back. If you remember what that ball did there, it bounced back about a third of the height that I dropped it from. So that makes it about 30% efficient. Now think for a minute, that actually the human ankle is 250% efficient. So you can think in your head there thinking, ah, oh, hang on a sec, able bodied people have got one hell of an advantage because they're getting several times over, eight times the amount back that you put into it. So energy return, or getting the most effective energy return, is the most important thing to a prosthetist or to the athlete themselves. All right, the next one is stiffness. Stiffness is the resistance to something being squeezed. So, just because I've got this to hand. Um, this is a child's toy that I play with quite a lot, because I'm a big kid. Uh, this is what I use to simulate and test prosthesis devices, but effectively it is a running blade similar to the cheetah one you saw earlier. Stiffness is the resistance to me squeezing that. Now the, the, the force that tries to squeeze that is basically a result of the body weight coming down and someone pushing off the floor. Right, why don't you put these up? I'm actually going to slip these on and I'll show you exactly what happens. Right, last time I put these on, I was running in the sports up here and I slipped up over and I ran into a wall because I couldn't stop on them. So, um, they do kind of come with an advisor. Yes, what are you saying? <laughs> Absolutely fine. I'll make sure I'm not in the same direction as you. I gained a, quite a good insight into prosthesis because one of the, 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 the iffy things about, one of the common questions I get asked when I go to conferences is, how can you do research into the disabled because you're not disabled yourself? And actually, it was because of that that I started doing this because I, I thought it was a really valid point in that is it wise for a researcher such as myself to do research into the disabled? if I don't know what it's like to have an amputation, and I never will. But what I learned by using these was, was that if you ever watch someone walking with energy return procedures like this, they can never stand still, because your foot has so many muscles in it that fire all at the same time to keep you upright. You can't do it with these. So, energy return. So stiffness is basically, we should put the safety thing on first. Ah, safety device, if you really need them. Okay, so, right, okay. so when someone is using a prosthesis in a race, they can't stand still, they have to constantly correct, because their centre of gravity, which in my case is quite high, it's not quite tall, is only about here, the centre of their chest. When you're actually walking around normally, your muscles in your foot and your legs can correct as you don't wobble around. And this, because I've got a very small contact phase, I have to constantly shift my feet to keep myself upright. When someone runs a 100 metre race, they have a step rate. So that's the number of steps per second okay, they do. And someone that is running a 100 metre race will generally run at about four and a half times a second, 4.5 hertz, effectively. And that will be consistent from when they start through to when they, they actually end. Um, but if you notice know what happens here, all these, what my human leg can do is because it can generate power, I can moderate the height that I jump up and how high and how quickly. A person with prosthesis can't do that. All they've got is their body weight. So I, if I actually slow, if I try and bounce faster, my actual height comes down. Now the problem with that is, is if my height comes down closer to the ground, I don't, my leg, my ground clearance, the ability to, my step length, will, won't be as big 
because I'm not going as high in the air. So it's important to match the prosthesis to the person's body weight. The other problem you've got is, is I'll take one of these off. This is where it gets really hairy. Right. I'll show you something that I'm not supposed to do because I've got my props to do this. Basically, the biggest problem with amputees isn't those that are double amputees, single amputees. Your human leg is what we call an active device. It can constantly correct, generate power and do different things. Prosthesis can't. If I'm trying to run with one human leg and one prosthetic leg, in the course of a 100 meter race, for example, you start in the starting blocks, you get faster, you then maintain that speed, you get that speed to the maximum part, then it falls away again. The prosthesis only has one response, so it can only bounce in one way. The human leg can't, so for, well, the human leg, sorry, can. So if you imagine me trying to run like this, that leg is having to come higher than that leg, but it can only respond to my body weight going, going on it actually is. Right, so, this is what I was going to try and do. Imagine me at a, a steady state speed like this. So my left leg is having to compensate. My right leg here is having to bring the leg up higher, not just because of the extra leg length, but also because the spring in the right leg is different to the spring in the left leg. If I actually now increase that, you see how I'm hitching my hip? I'm getting out of breath. It's because basically the actual bounce, the response, is different between that side and that side. And the reason for that is, is that as speed changes at different phases of the race, at the start, at the middle, at the end, that balance between the two sides will change. And as a result, that compensation, actually nothing now, will change. So, imagine at the steady state, it's fine. If I suddenly change it, I can't maintain it. And that's why you get where people wobble, slow down, speed up, and get fatigued. But, there is something that a colleague of mine uh, has proposed as a reason as to why bilateral amputees may have a sporting advantage over able-bodied people, because there was all that debate about the stories. Right. Think about trampoline. Think about how you gain height on a trampoline. You basically get in synchronisation with the springs and you generate positive height upwards. If you try and work against that bounce, like that, my height comes down and goes lower. What we think is happening with Pistorius or a bilateral amputee is, when they get into a position where their speed is completely level, so they're not accelerating, they're not de-accelerating, they're basically building harmony, they're using the bounce of the shoes in tandem with their body weight, and their energy cost will reduce. So they get to that point whereby they'll start running. Get my breath back first. <laughs> then they'll accelerate. And at the moment, it's costing energy because the spring isn't working with them. I'm not gaining extra height here because I'm not working in sync with the shoes. If I get in sync with the shoes, my energy cost goes down. So what we think is actually happening is with someone like Pistorius or a double amputee, is purely that they're getting in sync with their shoes, but the unilateral amputee can't do that because they're impeded by their sound leg, which can't respond the same way. Does that sort of make sense? Good, because I'm freaking that. <laughs> okay. So, let's look into this situation. This is the uh, controversy last year. It's about where the story is accused Oliveira of having a technical advantage over having longer limbs. And the best way to explain this situation is with this cartoon, which I found by accident. If you have a limb that is longer, yes, your stride length will be longer. But because the limb is longer, if you can imagine, for example, no, best not. Right. If you can imagine, it actually takes more energy to swing. If you imagine having a tennis racket and you're hitting a ball, it takes a certain amount of energy, you swing it. If you make that racket twice as long, it's going to take you a lot longer to cover the same distance. So yes, you will be able to generate more force, and it is, it, you know, it is a longer limb, it will generate more distance, but you've got to use more energy to make it move at the same speed as the shorter one. You see what I mean? And the, the point of this is, if you look at the roadrunner, he's there spinning his little legs, and the coyote is just 
cranking its long legs over. The thing is, Pistorius accused Oliver of having an advantage, but in reality, if you make the limbs longer, they've, they've still got to generate the energy to actually move that distance. If the limbs are too long, they won't be able to move them fast enough to keep up with the shorter leg guys anyway. That's why, traditionally, in the 100 meter sprint, in a bodied sport, shorter guys generally are faster sprinters because they accelerate quicker. The outlier of that is someone like Usain Bolt, who's six foot four or something, he's very unusual, and basically he's a once in a generation freak. He shouldn't be in a 100 meters, really. He should be a 400 meter runner, because taller guys cannot accelerate their limbs as quickly. So, yes, Oliveira may well have actually had a longer stride. Actually, the truth of the matter really is, is that Oliveira actually had had limbs that were too short in the months preceding the games, got given better prosthesis, and was then able to actually have limbs that actually consummate with his actual height. So, actually, as it turned out, I actually did the calculations on it anyway, and actually Pistorius' strike was actually longer than Oliveira's, so it was just sour grapes. <laughs> The problem that really boils down to this though, and a lot of my work is based on this, is really about how um, maybe what we're really doing is comparing apples and oranges. You can't really compare able-bodied and disabled people because ultimately they're just different. It's not that one's better than the other. They both use different forms of locomotion. A prosthesis, all it can do is spring and bounce. It can't do anything else. A human leg can generate power, it can do different things, it can fatigue, a prosthesis can't. It's a bit like comparing a motorcycle to a car. They both go really fast, but they both work differently. So the problem maybe where we should be going is whereby you should just treat them both separately. So should an athlete really better use technology to give them a competitive advantage? And that's something you really want to think about next time you see something on TV. And the future? Well, this is the problem. Oliveira is Brazilian. The next Olympic Games is going to be in Rio in four years' time. So he's probably going to want to run now, having seen Pistorius cross over table body person, he might want to do that as well. And as you probably know yourselves in life, once someone kicks open the door, like the four minute mile with Bannister, once someone had done it once, then everyone else was going to realise that such a goal is achievable, such a, a goal is possible and worthwhile. So, this is a problem that isn't going to go away, it's going to get worse. So, it's one of those sort of things that you have to think about in that when you agree with disability or not, or whether you think that disabled athletes and able-bodied athletes should mix isn't actually really a discussion of what the point is it's going to happen. So how we deal with that is really where future research is going to fall in. And that's basically it. And I'm sweating now. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about anything whatsoever? <laughs> The actual spring itself is made of carbon fibre and that, that spring is tailored to the is based purely on the body weight. So someone that's heavier, like myself, would have a very, very stiff prosthesis and someone that's lighter would have a very different prescription. In addition to that, what you guys won't see when you watch TV is that because the height, basically the height you get off the ground, the amount of force you put to the ground is different whether you run the 100 metres, the 200 metres or the 400 metres. The 100 metre the emphasis on doing well is based on generating as much force into the ground as you can. On the 400 metres, because the event lasts, let's say for the sake of like a minute, it's less than that, let's say it's a minute, you're using not only power in your legs, but also your aerobic system. So as a result, there's as much as, a, once you get past that 35 seconds, the last 25 seconds of that race are used from your physiology, your aerobic physiology. So it's not just about, it's not just about muscle power. Because the speed is lower in the 400 metres than it is in the 100 metres, the type of prosthesis that an athlete will use should be different. They're not always because some athletes can't afford to have multiple prosthesis. Pistorius can because he's a multi-million pound endorsed athlete and he will have different prosthesis for each different event that he will do. But the poorer athletes won't have access to that, uh, the same amount of technology. They'll have one set of prosthesis, which means it's only tailored to one running speed. So it means that in the other events they won't be able to run as well because that type of bounce won't be in synchronisation with their leg and their body weight properly. Do you know um, when people are training, yeah. the athletes are training, if they only a certain amount of time they can spend with prosthesis, I'm thinking of like, what you're saying about sores and things like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean realistically, in the case of the running ones, you see there, because they are so stiff, um, they'll put them on 20 minutes before the event and they'll take them off the second the event is over because it's, they're just, for a start like you saw with me, you can't stand upright 
for very, you can't you can't stand still. But also just because I mean, actually, it's a good question. Since the aloe vera, when they did the Paralympics, um, they had most of those athletes don't specialise in different running disciplines. They'll do the 100 metres, 200 metres, and the 400 metres. Each one of those races has a couple of heats, maybe a semi-final and a final. If you've qualified all the way through, you have to do 12 races. If you look at what happened in London, Pistorius was generally okay right the way through, but Oliveira, who was having real problems fitting to his prosthesis properly, was limping in his last few events, and it was because the damage to his tissue was so severe that it just, it, 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 like I say, it's, imagine just wearing a pair of shoes that are too small. It had just torn open the soft tissue around his limb, and he was basically just having to make do as best he could to get through the event, and it was incredibly painful. Yeah, but what you'll also get is, what complicates the situation, we get what we call fluid redistribution. So the fluid, the water, all the that makes up that stump, it will change shape every day. So it's like wearing a shoe, three sizes too small, that changes size every day in a different way. So you can never correct it, which is why it, it's really a question of money with these things. If you have a better, if you have a better prostate, the better the prosthetist you have, the better the fit that you can get, then the better the comfort you're going to have in the long run. If you have cheap prosthesis, then you're going to be very, very painful. And that's really what separates prosthesis design from something as little as 10 years ago to what you can get now. They're much better fitting and they're much more comfortable you can wear for longer. So, yeah. Is that an issue for treatment? For training? Yeah, for training. Yeah, I mean, actually there's a photo of quite a few, sometimes you see it where they, they turn up with a sports bag, not to make light of anything, but in the same way that you would get a tennis racket out and a tennis ball and play tennis for a bit, you'll see them open their bag out, pop two legs there, and there's another two legs there, and they'll slot themselves into different legs based on whatever that training session is at that time of the day. If they're working out in the gym, for example, they'll wear more traditional looking, you know, human looking prosthesis. If they're on a the track, they'll be using purely running ones. But yeah, it's, it's, the problem comfort is a massive issue. Um, you'll find they can't wear them a lot of the hours. There's a lot of time of the day they have to take them off because they're just too uncomfortable. I mean, uh, not to linger on the Pistorius murder case, but just as an example there, he woke up in bed and apparently the first thing he did was swing around to get his legs and put them on. He can't sleep in them and there's no point. Um, so, yeah, that, it is incredibly difficult. In fact, the guy that I did the cycle one for, for example, obviously he couldn't even stand on that. It wasn't designed to be stood on. But he has, to, he has to take breaks quite regularly, every 20 minutes, 30 minutes, he, he has to sit down and take the load off it because he's putting a lot of strain. Um, also, compared by the fact he's an ex-rugby player, so he's quite heavy, and he's still trying to lose weight, and he needs to get his weight down because it'll put less load on, obviously, the socket joints. So, yeah, weight loss is quite important. Uh, if you're, the problem is, is that it's difficult when you're an amputee to have a high level of activity because, you, obviously, it's very difficult to do, but you need that high level of activity to keep your weight down because if you start gain, if your BMI starts going too high, if your weight goes too high, then you're putting added strain on it. And the same thing you can do on your own joints if you were overweight yourself. So yeah. Cool. How long do you think it'll be before a prosthesis is designed that outdoes the human leg? Funny you say that, right? I actually um, there's a graph that I, I drew uh, a few months ago. If you actually look at the way that the world records progress, I actually took that slide out because I thought I'd be dragging on too long, but there's actually a <laughs> The actual way that we've performed in uh, amputee sprinting, for example, 100 metres, follows what we call a typical degradation curve, whereby with any sport, you get a lot of world records set early on because people are understanding how the sport works. And eventually that slows away, and you get what we call get to diminishing returns, whereby it's incrementally very difficult to set a new world record. And it's like a ski slope. And amputee sprinting is no different to any other sport. You get the ski slope. You do get a couple of blips though. The first blip was in 88 when these energy return prosthesis were introduced. Suddenly you get this big downswing of performance because a second and a half dropped off world records of empty sprinting virtually overnight. You've got someone like Pete, Johnny Peacock now, our own guy one gold, who can do the 100 metres under 11 seconds. That puts him within a second of Usain Bolt on an average day now. If you look at that degradation curve and run a line through it, or a polynomial line through it, a curved line of best fit, it should mean that in 2000, at, well the games in 2024, you should have, in theory, an amputee that can make the 100 metres able body final, in theory. But the reality actually is that we need technology to change. What we need is effectively what we call active prosthesis. So if you can imagine one of these springy ones being what we call passive, in that it doesn't create power itself, and active prosthesis, the cybernetic limb thing that I showed you. They're not currently allowed in the sport for reasons I mentioned on the fairness thing, in that if you do that, then it's going to unbalance the sport quite radically. But if you actually allow that, then within 10 years, you'll have someone that can run the 100 metre final. Provided they've got the genetics, they should be able to keep up and probably win. 
I would say this though, one thing I do know is if you could get an Ethiopian that would be able to run a decent marathon time, um, he would probably now, if you could find one of the right genetics, could run the marathon in under two hours. If you take someone like Richard Whitehead, I made, I made a joke earlier about the fact he was built like a, a rugby player. Interestingly, the marathon is actually Whitehead's better distance, even though he's so big in build. If you actually took someone, a traditional Ethiopian runner, it's quite slight and has a really well developed aerobic system, and actually put them in the marathon where they can perform well, that coupled with the fact they're bilateral amputating can synchronise their ability and run great distances should mean in theory they'll outrun an able-bodied person. The only reason we haven't seen that yet is A, there aren't any bilateral Ethiopian runners running around yet, and the second reason is at the moment it's very difficult for an amputee to run marathon distances because of the physical damage that it creates. But it does happen because you get uh, amputee athletes in the Ironman triathlon, I, I've done Ironman myself and I've, I met a couple that were doing it, and they were amputee athletes that can handle a marathon distance. And yeah, they get some damage, but they can, they can go the distance. In the end, we'll get socket design so good that the comfort issue is removed, and then it will take one athlete, only one, that will run the marathon distance, and everything will change overnight. The way that sport will be performed can be completely different, and then they'll go into two hours. So what I mean from what the long-winded answer is, the longer the running distance, the better the chance you'll see someone beat an able-bodied person because you can be more effective where there's a greater proportion of steady state speed and the less I do that is a long duration event. Anything over 400 metres. Cool. Can yeah, absolutely. Uh, that woman came um, with the marathon. She actually walked the marathon, didn't she? She had a riding accident. And they actually put some sort of robot to the suit. Like yes, I remember that's like an exoskeleton suit. Damage to her skin. Is she... I, don't know if, I don't actually know what the extent of her disability is. So I'm not really sure what her limiter actually is, but if you look at the technology she's using there, where it's effectively trying to stimulate nerves and brain patterns to actually get her to actually begin to move again, well, it, it, it doesn't take a genius to see that that technology, if that technology is already there, all we've got to do is make it lighter and more efficient, and it's doable. Um, the, the big ethical question you've got to ask yourself is, where does the point get reached where you think, well, this isn't really sport anymore, it's not really, it's an arms race, and that's really where it starts getting a bit difficult. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of um, uh, cycling, cycling my sport at the moment. And I've spent time in wind tunnels, in F1 wind tunnels, trying to make as aerodynamic as possible. And I know that I'm taking my own physiology, which isn't particularly brilliant, but I'm making myself more efficient than my competitors because I'm using better levels of technology than they are. And it's, it's an F1 approach, it's a Formula One approach, by beating someone not just through ability, but through knowledge. And that's really where sport is going. And that's quite troubling because the original, go back to the very start Greek Olympics, the, the first Olympics, it was really about one man being able to show what they could do over someone else. Now you start bringing technology into it and the whole thing goes completely nuts, it goes completely crazy. How do you stop it? The actual reality is, philosophers will tell you that you can't stop technology, it's a juggernaut. You can try and slow it down, but in the end you'll lose. So the problem we're going to have is sooner or later that we are going to have, you know, technology enhanced sports. In fact, we've already gone beyond that because what we're looking at now is genetic engineering whereby as a parent you can select the genes that you think are desirable for your children or not. And you can think, well, I quite fancy an athlete in the family, so you can bolster certain markers in their, in their genes and you can diminish others. You can already assess a child now whether they're going to have um, you know, a mental disability and determine whether you want to pursue having you know, that child or having a termination. So if we're at that level now, how long is it going to take before genetics are played with? So it's a bit worrying. In our lifetime that will happen. It might not be your own kids, it might be the generation after that. But you'll walk into a hospital and you'll select the genes that you want to have and that you don't want to have. Levels of IQ, physical development, length of life, uh, predisposure to depression or illness, all these markers. It's quite cool, but it comes with a warning, I think, on, on a lot of things. Anything else? What do you think are the sort of ethical implications if our Paralympians are going faster than our Olympians? I think it comes down to that apples and oranges thing again in that do you, I mean one of the, one of the most popular debates that we have at conferences when we talk about disability sport is should even the, the Paralympics and the Olympics be separated, should they be actually brought together as one sporting competition and if you do do that what do you do about it? Um, I think the problem that's going to, I personally believe that in the end the Paralympics will just be put out of date because what will happen is the level of technology outside of that will be, be good enough to be able to restore someone's disability and you've got to embrace that in the end because you can argue there's a human rights issue if you don't. Um, the, the, one of the problems that the governing body of the IPC actually has is you sit and think, well, let's say for example you allow someone to run around with a prosthesis and it's causing them these sores and this damage. If you don't, if you actually ignore that 
and there's actually a better technology out there that will allow them to run, but without those saws, aren't you actually impeding their human rights by not allowing them to use it? Um, especially where arguably athletes are now full-time individuals and actually receive income on that basis. So you're actually impeding them to work, which is another human rights issue. So you could argue then there'll be a court case where someone will say, I want to use a cybernetic limb, I'm entitled to it, it you know, improves my quality of life, and I'm my profession is as a professional athlete. And again, when that happens, the, the governing body will probably lose. Because it's, that's exactly what happened with Casey Martin with the golf cart thing. You can't defend it because the guy had the right to earn a living and it was considered that the golf cart wasn't part of the sport of knocking a ball into a hole from 300 yards. So it does get a bit dark. But much like the, the drugs argument that you put across yeah. last night, um, there will be a time where technology overtakes, overtakes able bodies. Yeah. And what kind of effect is that going to have on you know, kids watching and yeah. you know, that kind of aspect? Yeah, I think, I think it's just a tricky one. The way that kids are going to see sport now is going to be different. I think there's two different sides. I'll come back to that in a minute. I think the first thing was, one thing that I got from the London Paralympic Games was that disability became very watchable because they packaged it the right way, mm -hmm. they explained it, and heroes were made. And ultimately, if nothing, else, if, if nothing else comes good of that, the fact that several people that were disabled now and can be recognised in a high street, I think, was the best legacy to ever come out of that against beyond that of any stadium that we left. Um, yeah, there is going to be problems whereby kids are going to have issues, but I think you could argue, when we come back to this ethical thing again, about do, do the needs, I said this last night, but do the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. If that someone in a wheelchair is inspired to compete, is that better than the fact that several other people might be impeded by that technology? It's how you weigh it up. I think the problem is the way that we look at disability as a subject is changing. It's now becoming... It's, it's bridging across into, it's, it's broken down the barriers that we had built around disability. It, to a certain extent, it, go back to Gutman's original vision of Paralympics, it was designed purely to give people that were disabled a sense of purpose. It sounds, it sounds quite patronising now, but that was what it was for, it was to give them something to do. And then from about 1988 onwards, it, that stopped and it then became, this is an out and out competition. And when you speak to Paralympic athletes, and I've talked to a few, especially the GB cycling squad, they're all bloody animals, a lot of them. <laughs> Okay, I've had a long, interesting chat in a bar with those guys. Those guys will sell their own parents to win a gold medal. They are desperate to win, and they'll, they'll, they'll do anything to do it. And I've actually found in my personal experience that an athlete with a disability is more motivated than the able-bodied equivalent, because they're trying to get over the barriers that society has placed on them, and themselves, as well as actually succeeding to win. And they're highly, highly motivated individuals. So. I think the thing is in the end was, I think it's a bit, it's a bit like, if you look at the way that um, women have moved, and we're going to sexism now, I'm really going to hang myself, but if you look at how women have succeeded in the workplace from where we were 100 years ago with the suffragettes, and they do say that women to a certain extent have to work harder to succeed in the workplace. Now whether that's true or not, we can debate on the council line, but the point is, if you take a group that has been classed as a minority, they are going to be more better motivated to succeed in the short term. The same will be said of disability, you know, and disability sport, whereby the disabled, once they see there's now an avenue not only to perform, but also to succeed well and to earn good money and to be endorsed and to be famous, because that's always an attraction for people, then that will actually inspire a lot of people that would never have considered it. So there is some good things to it. Again, there are some dark things to it. I don't think I've really answered your question, but I've kind of gone around the house a little bit. <laughs> Can I pick that up? Because, yeah, of course. Um, you said about the endorsements. Yeah. And like that. I've got a couple of things I'd like to say. First of all, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only actually physically disabled person in the room. Yeah. I've just come out of hospital after almost losing the lower part of my leg. Yeah. I'm still under treatment at the moment. And for a while, I've been considering drastic surgery to take my legs off above the knee okay. because I've got severe knee damage, I yeah. don't feel pain normally and I wear old fashioned calipers like you can see unfortunately yeah, yeah, yeah. this one, like Forrest Gump, uh, you know, in the kiddie sort yeah, of yeah, yeah. part of the film. Mine never fell off when bullets chased me at school though, unfortunately. But um, it touched, obviously with a lot of things in this talk, it touch on quite sensitive areas yeah. that I'm very, very mindful of. The reason that I nearly lost the lower part of my right leg last week was because of these old calipers. Yeah. And I get rubs and pressure problems and all yeah, the rest. Yeah, yeah. But the surface area of my leg is bigger 
down a stump. Yeah. But then I'm taking on board what you're saying. That yeah. Stumps themselves have a set of problems and yeah, they do. Yeah. Them. And like the reason I use a chair and at home I don't wear my campers indoors um, for quite long periods of time sometimes to give my legs a rest. Yeah. So although the technology now is amazing compared to you know long joint silver styles or wooden legs and all that. It's still a long way from being normal or yes. being able to wear it all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I'm now I'm making a bit of a rambling sort of statement here, but the question that I'd like to ask is, like with military technology, yeah. it gradually filters into everyday yeah. life. You know, the internet was invented in the 70s by yeah. the military. We get it 30 years later. The level of these prostheses that you're talking about. Yeah. And you said yourself, you know, multi-millionaires like yeah. the historians can have a, a different leg for every day of the week, maybe two, should they wish to. Yeah. What about the affordability in general? Yeah. I mean, the NHS is already, as, as I've seen as well, first-hand the other week, vastly overstretched, and they give me a hard time when I push for, I want better appliances. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, this is what we can afford. This is what we're given. Yeah. Um, the, 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 like, if I may draw a parallel between, say, the Premiership in football and the lower leagues, yeah. you know, the, the normal guys, as it were, normal guys and girls that are getting the sort of normal limbs. Is there a going? Can you foresee a relationship happening between where it filtered down or that this technology? Yeah, I mean, would it become more affordable? You've, I mean, you've hit three different sort of themes there. One is that one of the barriers to sports technology generally get out of the easiest one is this access issue in that if you wanted to run and you can't, you've got to use NHS components and yet someone like Astorius has direct access to Oslo, which is the big, biggest manufacturer on the planet, and he can have whatever he wants, that either isn't fair. So that's something that the government really is trying to minimise. Second sort of theme on that is um, Again, this is something I touched on in another talk I was doing last night. I ended up up at the mountain with a Lama personnel uh, a couple of years back, and a lot of the guys had already left the service, and they were being supported by the NHS, local authorities and hospitals. And I'll be honest, uh, and they were pretty frank with me about it, they're, pr they're very, very stretched, and the level of prosthesis those guys are using are very, very basic. If you're still in the armed forces, you're at Headley Court. Now, at Headley Court, you get the, you know, it's, it's the Willy Wonka school of, you know, of uh, prosthesis, there's this black checkbook mentality, they'll give you whatever you need and I know a lot of armed forces personnel there are getting unique prosthesis based on, if they want to go kayak, they'll have a prosthesis made for that. Um, so there's definitely a have and have not thing. However, if you look at this energy return design I mentioned, one that Van Phillips created, that was originally created for, to try and improve on traditional prosthesis and slowly and steadily and surely it's filtered through to even the most basic prosthesis now uses that technology, but like your example, it's taken 20 years before it's become cost effective. And the reason is what normally holds that barrier is that how can something initially be made affordably by a company in great enough numbers so it can be profitable because ultimately this thing always comes down to business and money at the end of the day. And it's taken 20 years whereby now there's enough of it, sadly, enough of a market, mainly driven by the armed forces, that allows them to make these components cheap enough so they could then eventually filter the way into NHS. But the problem will be is the NHS will always lag behind what the cutting edge places will have. You'll get what you want in the end, but it will take you twice as long. You know, be a very old man. Maybe. <laughs> but the only way to look at it is this. I can't remember what, I can't remember what it's called now. There's a law about the rate of progress of technology in general. It's a, they use computer processing power as an example, whereby it's something like every two years the, the power of a computer quadruples. It, it, it's got a cubed relationship. So again, it's, it's kind of a ramp up strategy. So in 10 years' time, the computers will be. 30 times as powerful as they were before. It's that kind of thing. Prosthesis and, and any kind of technology development always works that way and that the rate of progress increases radically incrementally. So in theory, it won't take you as long to get it as it would have taken someone 10 years ago. You should receive it twice as quickly, basically. But what you receive will be the tricky thing. You know? In the same way, that, again, use mobile phones as an example. Just look at over 10, 20 years, what you can get on a free contract now when you go and get a phone. You can get an iPhone free now on a contract Five years ago, you couldn't even pay 200 quid for it. It's the same thing, it always boils down to money at the end of the day. Uh, but unfortunately, healthcare is one of the worst ones for it, especially because it's all based on geographically, where you live, how well staffed they are, how well funded. And if you're in a more, if there's not a lot of call for it in your region, 
then they don't have as many, you know, they don't have as much need to have the right staff, the right calibre of staff to support the disabled. Some places are better off than others. Yeah, and also the way that the NHS works, from the way I've seen it work, yeah. is that they love to pigeonhole people. So if you're one thing, yeah. you have a recognised condition that they put you in a category yeah. and you get X treatment. And then if you don't have that, even though your needs are actually the same, yeah. you don't get that. It's, it's, you get the postcode lottery that you mentioned, and yeah, yeah. you get that effective kind of lottery as well. Yeah. So it's very uneven. Because the irony often is, they'll often say to them who's disabled, why do you want to let you can run it? Can't you use your everyday ones? And we say, well, no, I want ones properly for running. They say, well, that, that's not really necessary. You don't actually need that. That's an addition. That's a luxury. But actually, they do need that because that's what's given them mobility, improved fitness and health care. They never look at the big picture. And in the case of, like, obviously, the guys that we've seen on screen, now, yeah. I mean, where their respective countries, they will be earning money, they will be paying tax yeah. back into the system. Yeah. But as you say, there's a serious lack of joined up thinking. Yes. Yeah. In that case, speculating to accumulate in a sense. I'll tell you something, a slide again I took out, actually, it was a paper I, I, I wrote um, towards my thesis about a year ago. I basically looked at the impact of when this technology was introduced in 1988, the energy return prosthesis, what the effect of that actually was. Prior to 1988, the sports, the countries that were winning medals at the Paralympics in amputee sprinting were a lot of places in the Middle East, Switzerland, Canada, those sort of places. The second that technology came in 1988, those, company, uh, those countries never won another medal. It suddenly shifted, suddenly Great Britain, South Africa and the US of A especially wiped all the medals out for the, for the last 20 years. And the reason? Because they've got access to the technology, they've got the money to develop it, and the other countries could not access that same technology to the same level of standard. Therefore, overnight, the countries plummeted down the medal stable. So yeah, there is that disparate have and have not thing. And that's, that's that balance out between enabling someone to compete and actually penalising other people as a result of it. It's just weighing up things, the ethical thing again. Yeah, it's tricky. So yeah. Thanks very much. No, You're sure. welcome. Cool. Yeah. And, and the NHS isn't forthcoming with it. Do they have to show some form of ability in that sport to then be sponsored? There's just no. They, what they, the model they're currently using now, which they did on the run up to London, was that um, basically gold medals means money to a country. The more gold medalists you have, the better off you will be. So there was a process that began about three years prior to London whereby talent scouts, for lack of a better expression, went out into a variety of places to find disabled athletes that could be that could be used to obtain gold medals. Now the obvious place to look was obviously the armed forces, um, but the armed forces were actually quite resistant to it because the argument is, and it's actually perfectly valid, just because someone, if someone wasn't doing sport before they lost their limb, why do they suddenly want to do sport when they have? You, know, you can't just assume that someone wants to be an athlete just because they've lost their leg. So that was one problem. The other problem was, was that the armed forces were very protective of their disabled, they do look after them. Um, and they, they were very, very cautious about allowing personnel to move out into the limelight in that kind of way. But there were talent scouts that were involved. Um, the Americans used a system called the Battle Back process, whereby they scout out talent within the armed forces. And in fact, a lion's share of amputees in the US team were all ex-service personnel or current service personnel. Um, in terms of cycling, they looked at any kind of athlete that could be used. They'd look at the disability first, then they'd do a fit, physical fitness test and work out any kind of sport that person could do reasonably well. So had examples whereby, take Sarah's story, Dame Sarah's story as she now is. She was actually originally a swimmer, and then they realised that she was very, very physically gifted and moved her across into cycling where actually she's been more successful. So it's about talent identification. But to answer your question, the key thing that's changed is because there's now money involved in medals, whether it's Paralympic or Olympic, and the thing to remember is if you are actually an athlete as such, a athlete that has the ability to win a gold medal will have the same level of funding that Chris Hoy would have got, even though they're disabled, it's, it's pure parity now. There's money involved, so it's in our interest to try and get as many people, as many bums on seats in a GB vest running around a track or doing something at the games. So the actual sports governing bodies are very, very active, but what you do find is the long-winded answer is that certain agents such as the armed forces can be quite reluctant to let their athletes into that environment. It's, uh, it, it depends on the country, some are more, some are better than others. Until recently the Australians were the best at it because they have a very sports heavy culture out there anyway. It's a way of life out there, it's a cool place to go.
Um, so, uh, yeah, it's slightly different. And you'll find the attitude of disability varies radically in each country. And actually, Great Britain as a country has, has changed radically its approach to disability in the last four years. And because of London, it's completely different. You know, people look at those guys in a completely different way. So, like I said, if nothing else, no matter how much legacy, when people talk about legacy and you know, what's this stadium going to be used for, what's the Olympic Village going to be used for, ignore all of that. If it inspires one or two guys to get up and actually do something worthwhile, then the whole thing, as I'm concerned, is a roaring success. But then, then saying that I didn't have to pay for it, well, I suppose I did pay for it by taxes. But, you know, it, something good would have come out of it. And in fact, Pistorius running for the first time in 2004 has only now inspired several other athletes to run. He was the only bilateral amputee that was running in 2004. At the Games in London, uh, half the field, so 12 athletes roughly, were bilateral amputees. Those guys are doing that because the Pistorius did it eight years ago. So it does inspire and, and it creates its own legacy. So, yeah. Cool. I think okay. we are, Well, thank you ever so much for a really very really fascinating and inspiring talk. So once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good. Last time I did something similar to this, we got really heavily into the ethics stuff, and tonight we've gone almost the more serious look at the healthcare. It's really interesting. You present similar material, and you get a completely different vibe. It's very cool. Should we get myself fitter to bounce on shoes for 10 minutes?